Okay, well, we're going to jump into our passage today. And uh, before we jump into that, about a year ago, or so, maybe about a year ago, a little over, Amazon came out with a TV show based on uh, The Lord of the Rings. This show was called The Rings of Power. It got mixed reviews. My own review of this show was mixed. Uh, it could have been improved if they had me involved, I think. Um, my fees would have been modest. You know, but overall, I enjoyed this. It was a good show. You know, I think uh, they struggled the most in the writing, but, you know, some good acting, and it was a very beautiful show. Well, um... Anyway, one of the side plots or central plots of this show was uh, the introduction of this character. And this particular part of the show is following this sort of tribe of wanderers. And one night a meteor falls from the sky and these two young people go and investigate. And the bottom of this smoking red crater is this mysterious figure. And they end up helping this guy. And he seems to be human, but he has no memory of who he is or where he came from. So as they released one episode of this show a week, there was a lot of speculation and people watching the show, okay, who exactly is this? Because no one really knew. And so he was called, in the discussions online at least, The Stranger. So who was this stranger? Clues were mixed. Some people thought, well, maybe he's the main bad guy of the show, Sauron. Other people thought, well, maybe he is who later becomes Gandalf, one of the great wizards or heroes. Some people said, no, it's, it's one of the other wizards that Tolkien wrote about in this universe. But as the show goes on and clue after clue was added in, um, they played with this idea of mystery and, and uncertainty. And so this added a lot of interest and tension because you didn't know exactly who this stranger was. This reminds me a lot of the passage we find ourselves in here today as we continue looking at Luke's gospel as he unpacks the story and the stories of that first Easter, the resurrection of Jesus. Last week, we looked at the first part of of Luke chapter 24 when we see the women going to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body and they find the tomb empty. And this was an experience of confusion, This was jarring. Has someone taken his body? Uh, The women have an appearance of some angels who say, no, no, you should have known better. He's actually been raised from the dead. And the women go back and they tell the other disciples that this angel came and said, Jesus was raised from the dead. And the other disciples flat out do not believe them. And so we find our heroes, if you will, in a time of confusion, questioning, and loss. Luke tells us that Peter alone of those 11 remaining disciples ran back to the tomb and he looked in and it says he went away wondering about what had happened. What has happened, Peter says. His world is turned upside down. The one he thought was going to be the Savior, the Messiah, save everybody is dead. He hears a strange report. He doesn't know what to think, doesn't know what's going on. What has happened? And sometimes we find ourselves in life looking at our situation saying, what has happened? We find ourselves in times of loss, a confusion, struggle, a, a doubt. Sometimes we look around and say, I, I don't know, is there a God? Is Jesus real? Is any of this real? Is it just wishful thinking? If God is real, where is he? Well, today we're going to look at the next part of Luke's story as he unpacks the resurrection of Jesus. And Luke's going to play with these themes of uncertainty, doubt, revelation, and faith. So I hope you got a bulletin when you came in. If you did, you can take that out and look at the passage. I've printed it off for you. If not, you could go to our uh, YouTube or Facebook page and download a PDF of it as well. Let's look at this passage that is going to speak directly to some of these confusions that we experience in certain seasons of life. So here's part one of this passage. I'm going to call this wrestling with doubt. So this is Luke 24, verse 13. Luke continues, now that same day, so this is Easter Sunday, that same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. Okay, two of who? Two of them, Luke says. Well, two of the other followers of Jesus, the ones that had holed up. So there was 11 disciples, other believers with him, and Luke has just told us what about them? The women say Jesus has been raised, and what is their response? We are told they don't believe it. Okay, so here are two of the followers of Jesus who do not believe the women that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And they are walking to this village. Verse 14, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Now, I don't think 
all experiences of doubt are necessarily bad. I mean, to look at it from one point of view, an experience of doubt can be part of a search for the truth. Okay, if we are Christians, we believe in the truth. And we believe in the truth of Christianity. And it's interesting how Christianity opens itself up to be falsified on this front. Notice, we believe that Jesus took on humanity and came into history at a certain point. You know, we don't believe Jesus died and rose again in a sort of symbolic sense. He didn't come and die mythically. And, you know, his resurrection is not just about our hope for the future and optimism that everything's going to be okay. We really believe God entered the timeline. And as such, we, we, we have to be involved with history. So we have to be wrapped up with this question of, okay, are these things really true? And so a process of doubting and questioning in a certain respect can be very healthy. Tim Keller wrote that a faith without doubt at some level can be like a body without antibodies. What are antibodies? Well, you get sick, you fight off some infection. It makes you stronger. Your body knows how to deal with that. And so sometimes I think God can allow us to go through a season of questioning our faith so that afterwards, once we wrestle with it, we emerge stronger because of it. I'd only suggest we also remember, also as Tim Keller says, that we also doubt our doubts. In other words, are we looking for the same standard of evidence from alternative theories as we are asking for from Christianity? And you know, we better also stop and think about what do we mean by faith? Because our culture, I think, has a very bad understanding of faith. And very easily, we Christians get pulled into it. When we think about faith in our popular culture, most people think, okay, faith is belief without evidence. Or perhaps belief against evidence. Well, it doesn't look like this is going to happen, but I just have faith. Well, this is not a Christian understanding of faith. Because again, Christianity is by necessity connected and concerned with, okay, what is true, what is actual, what really happened. So a better way to think about faith from a Christian perspective, I would suggest, it is not a step of commitment without evidence, or even worse, a step of faith against the evidence. What we would say is Christian faith is a step of commitment in line with the evidence and supported by the evidence. Now, there is a step of faith that's required because that evidence is not going to take us all the way. We cannot prove that Jesus is the Son of God. We cannot prove that he was raised from the dead. Actually, there's very few things we can prove in that sense. Can you prove to me the universe is older than five minutes? You cannot. Yeah, but I have memories that go back farther. Maybe they were just created. So interestingly, there's not much we can prove in an absolute sense. So Christianity is about following the evidence of the truthfulness of God, the truthfulness of the resurrection of Jesus, and that brings us to a certain point. And then we do make a decision to commit ourselves in faith to him. But it's not a step of faith against the evidence or without evidence. I think the best illustration I've heard for this is the illustration of marriage. All right, say two people are getting married. Do they know one another to some degree? I hope so. All right, has there been enough of a relationship established? Do they know enough about each other that they trust each other? In other words, is there evidence that this is a reliable and trustworthy person for me to commit to and live with the rest of my life? I hope the answer is yes. Okay, but do you know absolutely everything about that person? No. Uh, um, do you know that there's not some hidden thing in the closet that's going to come out later? Unfortunately, no. But notice what we do. We make that commitment, that step of faith, okay, hopefully in line with the evidence. But in the marriage commitment, there is a step of faith saying, okay, I don't know absolutely everything about you, but I know enough that I'm going to entrust myself to you. And I think that's a pretty good model for faith in Jesus. And there's a lot of things that go into that decision. Presuppositions. You're open to the possibility of a God. Uh, we'll get back to some of this in a minute. So, so these two people are walking on this path, wrestling with doubt. They don't believe Jesus was raised, but they're talking about this as they go, we are told. Look at verse 15. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. How interesting. In the middle of their experience of doubt, Jesus shows up there with them, 
and they don't realize it's him. The stranger appears with them, walking along beside them. Why didn't they know him? Well, he must have looked different or something, something mysterious about this. Even more mysterious, look, they were kept from recognizing him. Who kept them from recognizing him? We'd be tempted to maybe say that the devil or something, but that's nowhere in the context. And actually, this is a sort of expression you see often in the Bible called a divine passive. Sometimes things are said to have happened in a passive sort of sense, and the understanding is that it is God who did this. So the suggestion, the best bet is that it was God that kept them from recognizing, in fact, that this was Jesus. Why? Why do some Christians get cancer? I don't know. Uh, Why do some Christians go through seasons of crippling doubt and not others? I don't know. We'll see here in this story, it is God's purpose to reveal himself to these two. But for whatever reason, this is happening on God's timeline. And for now, they are kept from recognizing Jesus. It's very interesting. Look at part two. From tragedy to triumph. Verse 17. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Can you believe that? What are you talking about as you're walking along? Jesus says to them, as if he doesn't know. They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas. We'll stop there for a second. Why is only one of these two guys named? Or people, I should say. It could be his wife with him. could be his son with him. We don't know. You will notice, if you look at the stories of Jesus in the Gospels, it is very rare to find names of people. It's unusual. Most of the time, someone who's healed, there's no name. But occasionally, you will get a name dropped in the story. And there's been some thought about this. And what many have suggested, when we see the presence of a name like this dropped in the middle of a story where it's completely unnecessary, this is probably an indicator that this was the person who was responsible for the telling of this story. It's very likely that this is remembered because Cleopas is the one that told this story. He was the one who had this experience. He was the one that passed it on. And so the tradition remembered, oh yeah, it was Cleopas that told us this. Interestingly, it's very possible this is Jesus' uncle. I'm giving you a little paragraph on the back of your outline you can look at later. Basically, there's another person that is said to be of more or less the same name at the cross. And there's a church historian a couple hundred years later that tells us this was actually Joseph's brother. So it's very possible this is actually um, Jesus' uncle, Joseph's brother, uh, whose son goes on to lead the Jerusalem church, we're told, after the death of James. Well, they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem? who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, Jesus asks. Can you believe that? This story is written with classic, what is called dramatic irony, where what the reader knows is unknown to the characters in the story. So it sets up this interesting tension for us. What things, Jesus asks innocently. What's been going on in Jerusalem, Jesus asks. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. Now, Jesus was more than a prophet, but he was at least a prophet, someone sent with God's message. These guys know the identity of Jesus is controversial at the moment, so they start with, eh, he was a prophet. Powerful in word and deed, representing, referencing his teachings and his miracles. Verse 20, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Meaning they thought he was the Savior, the Messiah, who was going to come and save Israel. Bring forgiveness of sins. Bring the new covenant promised in Ezekiel. Deliver Israel from her enemies. Drive out the Romans. Establish the reign of the line of the throne of David once again. Bring peace and prosperity. They thought these things. And they say, what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. Interesting line. Verse 22, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. 
uh, they came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. So notice they relate this loss. They relate this death, murder, violence. They relate their grief. They relate their confusion. If you have ever gone in our culture through a season of doubt and questioning your faith, odds are part of that wrestling has been struggling with the question of the problem of evil and suffering. How can an all-good, all-powerful God allow so much evil and suffering all around us? Why did he allow this to happen to me? We see these two believers in Jesus struggling with a similar question. Our friend killed? Unjustly? Why? We lost everything. So we just see them broken and in despair over this. Here's part of what they're wrestling with. Now the stranger conveys some insight. Verse 25, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. He's talking about the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now, if there's any little conversation, it would be interesting to have been a fly on the wall to have listened in on. This would have been one of them. To hear Jesus himself unpack how the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, pointed to himself. To people who didn't realize he was Jesus. That would have been very interesting. Now, this is the Gospel of Luke. It is part one. It is written by a guy named Luke. The book of Acts that we have in the New Testament is written by the same guy. It is part two of the book of Luke. And if we go and look at the book of Acts, we will see a bunch of speeches where the apostles share the gospel, and they quote a bunch of Old Testament passages talking about how those passages pointed to Jesus. And so if you want to know what passages Jesus was likely going to, we can learn this from the gospel of Luke, most likely. And I've given you there a few referenced on the bottom of the page. Let me just show one of you, let me show you one of these verses that the Christians use in the New Testament to look back and say, look, this pointed to Jesus. Probably one of the ones Jesus looked at. Look on the screen. This is Psalm 118, verse 22. This is a psalm. It's a prayer written by a godly person facing suffering. And look at this verse. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. A metaphor of building a building. People are building this nice building out of nice stones. Oh, this one's garbage. Throw it aside. The builders reject the stone. Later, it turns out, no, we need that one. And that becomes the cornerstone, the capstone, the most important stone. Now, on the front end, none of us would have thought that was about Jesus. But once we know the Messiah comes, suffers rejection, dies, and then is raised back to life... All of a sudden now, we go back and look at this psalm of a righteous sufferer facing suffering, and we see this little line, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. A theme of rejection, the one that is rejected becomes the preeminent one. Once we know what happens, we can look and say, you know what, that's, that's Jesus. That can be read talking about Jesus. And there's a bunch of passages like this. So notice part of our answer to the problem of evil and suffering is that we believe Jesus was really raised from the dead. Like he says here, didn't you know the Messiah had to suffer these things and be raised? So part of our wrestling with the problem of evil and suffering is Jesus' resurrection, which we believe is the beginning of the final restoration of all things. And if indeed, at the very end, God intervenes, defeats death, brings in the new heavens and new earth, grants eternal life, evil's done away with, and we live forever with him, that helps. That helps us understand, in part, why God may allow evil and suffering for a time to serve certain purposes. Look at part three. Jesus' presence Nearly missed, but revealed. Verse 28, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. That is fascinating. The word there is conveying the idea that Jesus was pretending like he was going to keep going. 
That means he wanted to stay with them, but he acted like, he pretended like he was going to keep going. Verse 29, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. That is very fascinating to me. Why does he do that? Why does Jesus pretend like he's going to keep going? Why is it only when they ask him does he stay? It appears Jesus is not forcing himself on them. He did appear to them. He's cared for them. He's showed them some things. Seems to me this is a kind of test. Now, they don't know he's Jesus, but they know obviously he's someone that knows a lot about what God is doing and a lot about the scriptures and apparently a lot about Jesus in this situation. So it's almost like a test. Does he want them or not? Or sorry, do they want him or not? And I think this shows us something essential about the life of faith or about the life of non-faith. As we think about the different dynamics that go into whether a person believes in Jesus, commits their life to him, the dynamics that go into a person if they fall away and reject their faith and follow another path, there's a lot of things at play there. But one of the things that is always at play is, what do I really want? Do I really want this to be true? Or would I rather not? have this be true. Now, there are exceptions to this. Uh, Sometimes we have uh, believers in Jesus who ends up losing their faith with much sorrow, like they wish they could keep believing. They want it to be true, but they just don't believe it anymore. That does happen. And likewise, sometimes we get someone who's maybe an atheist or someone doesn't believe, and they end up believing in Jesus, and they don't want to. So there are exceptions, but I think most of the time, one of the things that is driving our faith commitments is deep down, what do we want? Do I want there to be a God who I'm accountable to? Do I want Jesus to be real? Or would I rather prefer this stuff isn't real? I mean, if we're honest, this is a dynamic that goes into how we choose what to believe or what not to believe. So it's like Jesus gives them this test. Well, I'm going to keep going. Do they want him there or do they not want him? Consider what God says to his people, Israel, in Jeremiah 29, 13, a great time of trial and judgment. He says this in a time of promising their restoration. God says to his people, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So there seems to be an essential commitment in seeking for the truth that God says, oh, you're looking for me? Okay. I talked with a a woman earlier this week online in a meeting I was in. She said, for 12 years I prayed to the God who created me, and I didn't know who he was. So finally, I realized it was the God of Jesus, and she became a Christian. It seems like God honored that search, that groping, and revealed himself to her. Uh, Look what Jesus had said in John 18 to Pilate, the Roman governor, in his trial. Jesus said to Pilate, you say that I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. And look at this line. Jesus' assessment. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Jesus seems to be saying there is, there, at some level, there is a commitment to the truth, and if you have that, you will find your way to me. Pilate answers, verse 38, what is truth? And walks away. Well, back to our passage, verse 30. While Jesus was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. What does that sound like? You heard that kind of language before? What's that sound like? Sounds like the Last Supper. In Luke's gospel, it also sounds like the feeding of the 5,000. Remember that miracle? Uh, Look at him. Here's the feeding of the 5,000. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. Here's the Last Supper, Luke 22. He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So this stranger comes in. For whatever reason, he takes charge of the role of authority at this meal. He takes the bread, speaks the blessing, which is a prayer of thanks to God is what that is. He breaks the bread. And verse 31, then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, And he disappeared from their sight. 
That is weird, but cool. Remember, Jesus has not been raised to normal human existence. Okay, this is not just a resuscitation to normal human life. Okay, in Jesus' resurrection, he has been raised to the final human 2.0, the glorified body, the transformation that we will all share one day when the final coming of the kingdom comes, if we are in Christ, if we, are, if we belong to him. And so notice he can do things like phasing in and out of buildings and appearing and disappearing in locked rooms and, and, and this sort of thing. 32, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They say, oh, now I get it. Oh, that was Jesus? Oh, no. Wow, that was great. So notice they, they had an inward experience of something direct, something supernatural, and something spiritual in that experience. So it's interesting to me, we see these disciples, these followers of Jesus, growing in faith and awareness of who Jesus is in four different ways in this story. First of all, in community. They're with each other. They're walking along. They're discussing what's happened. Also in the scriptures, Jesus opens the Bible and they look, say, oh yeah, this is what the scriptures say. Uh, in the breaking of the bread, they finally reveal him, which is reminiscent of the central act of Christian worship, the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And finally and directly, inwardly, they have this experience of this direct experience of God in the heart. Now notice we can't conjure and manufacture that fourth one. Like we can't make that, we can't conjure up and make that direct experience of the divine take place. We can't do that. That's beyond us. We depend on the Spirit for that, who blows where he pleases. But notice we can do these other three. We can spend time with one another in Christian community. We can seek to learn from the Scriptures. Uh, we can participate in the worship of the church and the breaking of the bread. And so these are ways that we position ourselves in the right spot where God's Spirit is, is best able to bring forth the kind of transformation we seek. So this is the goal of something like Rooted, our, our main pathway to discipleship here at the church, to devote yourself to 10 weeks of engaging in these rhythms of community and scripture and breaking of the bread to provide some space for God to kindle something in your heart. So how about you? If Jesus were pretending to move on from you, what would you do? Would you want him? Would you invite him in? Or would you just ah, let him go? More comfortable without house guests. We go part four, Roman numeral four, moving forward in faith. Okay, now these guys are now they're lit. Verse 33. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. So apparently they'd gone to Emmaus, seven miles. It's nighttime. They're like, nope, we're going back right now. They go back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with him assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Now notice, before these two are able to get a word out, what do they hear? Now something has happened since they've been gone. The 11 disciples who did not believe when they received the women's report, now we're told, once these two get back, now the rest of them do believe. Like, Jesus has been raised. Why? What are they told? It is true, the Lord has risen and appeared to who? Simon. Who is Simon? That's Peter. Now, this is profoundly interesting because we are never told the story of that appearance, which is fascinating now, in the end of the Gospel of John, we see Peter meeting the risen Jesus back up in Galilee. Remember the fishing incident, if you recall that story. But they haven't gone back there yet. They're still in Jerusalem. This is still Easter day or that night. So we are told that Jesus appeared to Peter there in Jerusalem that day. But we are never told that story in the New Testament. Now, Paul is aware of this story. Look what Paul says in his summary of the resurrection witnesses in 1 Corinthians 15. On the screen, he says, For what I received, I pass on to you as first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter's name in Aramaic, 
So Paul knows, oh yeah, Jesus appeared to Peter. But in none of the Gospels are we told the story. And I think that is interesting and helpful because it shows us that the Christians were not just inventing the best story they could. Like, who's Peter? He's the top dog of the disciples, so to speak. If there is any resurrection appearance we would expect, it would be this appearance to Peter, but it's never narrated for us. Luke instead tells us the story of Cleopas and company. And so we see there that, look, for whatever reason, the Christians weren't just inventing these accounts, because if they were inventing them, a flashy, awesome appearance to Peter, that, that would have been the first thing to invent and make up. For whatever reason, we don't have it. Verse 35, then the two told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized them by them when he broke the bread. So after they hear about Peter, now they tell their story. Yeah, we saw him too. So notice we have multiple witnesses, it is remembered. We have multiple witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. It's not like this happened to one person. Said, oh yeah, I saw Jesus. And everyone's like, oh, he saw Jesus. It's remembered that there were multiple appearances of Jesus to multiple people. Notice how Paul makes that point in 1 Corinthians 15. By the way, an undisputed letter of Paul that no one questions is really written by the Apostle Paul. Okay, I can show you atheist Bible scholars who don't believe in Jesus. They have no dog in this hunt, so to speak. They say, oh yeah, that's really the Apostle Paul in the first century. Look what he says. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So did Jesus really rise from the dead? We really only have two possibilities. And one of those possibilities is not that the Christians are lying about this. Pretty much all scholars recognize at this point, the Christians are not being deceptive about this. They are not lying about Jesus being raised from the dead because they are not acting like people that are lying about this. There'd also be no reason to invent this story. There are far easier things to say than having Jesus raised from the dead. Um, they go out and they give their lives for this. They're willing to die for this. Uh, there's no reason to make it up. It'd be much easier to say, we saw a vision of Jesus. He's vindicated. He was a prophet. Uh, you killed him. We're going to continue his teachings. They didn't do that. Instead, the center of everything became, no, he rose from the dead. So, so everyone agrees the Christians believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. So I'll give you an example. This is a German Bible scholar, Gerd Ludemann. This man is an atheist. He does not believe in God. He does not believe in Jesus. Look what he writes. It may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. He's not a believer. But what he's saying there is, it's clear the Christians at least thought Jesus had been raised from the dead. So we have two choices. One choice is that Jesus really was raised from the dead. The only other credible possibility is that these were hallucinations. These were illusory hallucination experiences. That's the only other possible explanation. Because clearly the Christians think Jesus was raised from the dead. So it's either a hallucination or it really happened. But there's some tricky things about hallucinations. Remember, it is remembered that this didn't happen once and just to one person. It's remembered that, look, many different Christians had this experience of seeing Jesus raised from the dead. And it's it's understandable, perhaps, for a hallucination to one person of Jesus raised from the dead. It's difficult to think of group hallucinations happening to people at different places and different times. It's particularly difficult to think about hallucinations in the case of Paul. Did Paul want to see Jesus? Remember, he was an enemy of the church, he tells us in Undisputed Letters. He was a persecutor of the church. If there was one person that never wanted to see Jesus or never crossed his mind or only felt, wow, gee, I'm glad he's dead, it was Paul. Yet he tells us, last of all, he appeared to me. Paul was not whipping himself up into a frenzy of hopeful anticipation. Oh, if only Jesus had survived. He was glad he was dead. Paul says, I saw the risen Jesus. And so he gave up everything to proclaim that faith. So our choices are hallucination experiences or real resurrection. 
And what you decide on that will depend on a variety of things. One will be, are you open to the possibility that there's actually a God who actually works in the world? It's one of the questions you need to wrestle with. If that's possible, this is possible. You'll also have to wrestle with, do I want this to be true? Or do I deep down not want this to be true? In many cases. Mm-hmm. So I think the best explanation for the church's behavior, I think the best explanation for the evidence we see just in terms of historical phenomena from the early church is that this actually happened. Jesus really was raised from the dead. That explains the puzzle of how the early church behaved. They at least thought he was raised from the dead. Well, back to verse 33. There they found the 11, and those with them assembled together, saying, It is true, the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. Well, what's the bottom line for us in this passage? Let's put it this way. I think the challenge for us is to seek the risen Christ. Seek the risen Christ. Three suggestions. First, by making sure you really want him. Again, if he's pretending to go on from you, what would you do? There you go. Invite him in, Chuck says. Amen to that, right? Look what they almost missed. What would have happened if they just let him go? They would have missed something. They would never have known who he was. They wouldn't realize it was him. So they came that close, but thankfully they wanted whoever this guy was, and they sought him out. So do you really want this to be true? we got to wrestle with that, because if we're honest with ourselves... So much of the time, what drives us is not really what we think or what we know, but really what we want the most. And we're good at constructing reasons why that's the best thing to do. Or is that just me? Only me that does that? Second, by believing that the testimony of the witnesses is, hist- is historically true. I mean, we can, we can make a robust case for the truthfulness of these things. The women is the first witnesses. That's strange. You wouldn't invent that. If you were making this up, notice Paul even leaves them out in his summary in 1 Corinthians 15. It's already been edited for PR. Paul doesn't even mention the women in his official remembrance of the witnesses. But we're told they were the ones that saw it first. Disciples didn't believe? That's embarrassing. Why is it written like that? Well, because it happened that way. Remember, yes, we have this book, but this is a product of those people that were there. Paul is an eyewitness, he tells us, to the resurrection of Jesus. In a letter that no one questions is really written by him. Paul's our earliest Christian writer. Even though the Gospels record an earlier time, they're written after Paul's letters. Third, by searching for Jesus in community, Scripture, and in the breaking of bread. In other words, continue in those rhythms of a follower of Jesus trusting that God by his spirit will bring forth that connection with him that we desire. Well, today we look at this very mysterious passage out of uh, Luke's gospel. As we sit in on this encounter with this stranger on the road to Emmaus, as Jesus comes to two of his followers, gripped by doubts, uncertainty, confusion, and he goes on to give them an experience of himself, only after testing them to see if they really want him. And we said, bottom line for us to seek the risen Christ. Well, Amazon's show here, The Rings of Power, people speculated the whole season as far as the identity of this stranger, uh, this character. For a while, you are led to believe he is, in fact, the evil one, uh, Sauron. And that's made clear that no, actually, he is good. And then in the final episode, the writers tip their hand and clearly indicate who this is. It turns out this character is a kind of divine being who comes to earth, takes on humanity. And this is the only the beginning of this uh, stranger's story, but he will go on to lead, save, protect. He will experience suffering and even die and be murdered. But this character down the road is actually raised from the dead in glory and triumph. So it's an interesting picture of the career of Jesus, who, like this guy, meets these two on the road to Emmaus as a stranger. 
So go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Repay no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.